This broadcast is the property of Codependents Anonymous. Reproduction without written permission from Codependents Anonymous is not permitted. And we'll begin the meeting with the CODA opening prayer. In the spirit of love and truth, we ask our higher power to guide us as we share our experience, strength, and hope. We open our hearts to the light of wisdom, the warmth of love, and the joy of acceptance. Um, today, our speaker is Rita B. from Arizona, whose topic is how no crosstalk guidelines keep CODA meetings safe. Rita will have um, 40 minutes to share, uh, and then she can uh, stop for questions. And uh, with that, Rita, I'll turn it over to you. While we're waiting for Rita to uh, come on audio, Rita, you may need to press star six. Um, while we're waiting for Rita to come on uh, to, to be able to hear, for us to be able to hear her, I noticed that we have someone entering the meeting from the area code 480 and someone from the area 613. So um, if any of you would like to identify yourselves, we have Gail who has... I'm sorry, I, I, may have, I may misremember your name, the lady who's in Colorado Springs. And uh, just to tell us your name while we're waiting for Rita to come online. My name is Linda, and I'm in Southern California. And uh, I'm happy that y'all are here with us today. Okay, hi everyone. I am grateful to be here today and I am um, going to be sharing about how no crosstalk guidelines keep CODA meetings safe. Um, I did, do I have 30 minutes? Is that correct? Or, or 40. <laughs> oh, 40. Oh, okay. However, however Great. long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Linda. Okay, so um, I just want to first read a, um, a, a, I'm just going to read the Code of Guide to Sharing and what is crosstalk that um, I, I, I hear at a, my home group meeting, and we use this regularly, and I just want to read it, and then I will expound upon that. Code is Guide to Sharing. As we pursue our recovery, it is important for each of us to speak as we are able. Many of us find speaking among others, especially strangers, a very difficult task. We encourage people to begin slowly and carefully. It is the intention of every CODA member and group not to ridicule or embarrass anyone. Nothing that is shared is unimportant or stupid. The sharing of our experiences is best done with I statements. Crosstalk and feedback are discouraged. What is crosstalk? Crosstalk can be giving unsolicited feedback, advice giving, answering, making you and we statements, interrogating, debating, criticizing, controlling, or dominating. It may also include minimizing another person's feelings, or experiences, physical contact or touch, body movement, such as nodding one's head, calling another person present by name, or verbal sounds and noises. In our meetings, we speak about our own experience, and we listen without comment to what others share. We work towards taking responsibility in our own lives rather than giving advice to others. Crosstalk guidelines help keep our meeting a safe place. Our CODA literature provides many, many things that 
could be read regarding crosstalk. And um, what I found for my own recovery was the newcomer's handbook. There's a whole section on um, me, um, crosstalk, and it's in the newcomer's handbook, page 19 through, um, I think it goes through page 24. And it's, it really has a defining definition of what crosstalk is. And then there's these other pamphlets, um, attending meetings. Um, that also talks about speaking, sharing, and listening, which incorporates our crosstalk language. And if you read, um, there's this awesome pamphlet or booklet called Experiences with Crosstalk. And in the back of that, there is a list of other pamphlets that you could read that um, talk about crosstalk. And two of the ones I've just mentioned are in there. And then if you actually set up a CODA meeting in the new, new meeting starter handbook, there is also a very small section of what that is. And what I just read is also in there. And our fellowship service manual, that is an awesome manual because everything you ever questioned and don't know something about in CODA is in there. And so um, I would encourage everybody, it's a really long document. And it is really boring. I just want to let you know in advance. However, at the same time, it's it's a guideline that has everything you ever questioned or needed to know about things in CODA recovery. So I would encourage everyone to, you know, just kind of peruse it. You can skip around and and just kind of look up information about um, things that you may have questions about. Um, my first sponsor in CODA, uh, you know, that was her directive to me. Every time I had a question, she would direct me to the fellowship service manual. And so I've, I've learned a lot from that experience. And so crosstalk. Crosstalk um, is a tool that recovery people in CODA use to have healthy meetings. And being from a very dysfunctional family myself, healthy meetings are very important to me because a healthy meeting in my perspective um, supports my individual recovery so that I can be that whole person that I'm, I'm practicing to be and helping healthy meetings help me to thrive in my recovery and healthy meeting, healthy meetings really matter because they provide safety. And in recovery, that's kind of the point of, you know, the circles that we engage in is to find that safety, to be authentic, to be vulnerable, to have the time that we need to express the things that we may not say outside of these circles, except maybe in a therapist's office. And again, I want to reiterate this very profoundly, these CODA meetings are not therapy. If you need therapy, I would suggest you seek a therapist in conjunction if that is necessary. So on that note, crosstalk is, this can harm meetings and it can, it can, you know, um, break down a meeting. In my experience, I belong to a very good group. It was thriving very well. And maybe in year number five of my recovery, that group that I, that I, that I, I, um, that was my home group started to fall apart because of crosstalk. And crosstalk is very subtle. It can become very subtle. And if it's not addressed in those moments of subtlety, it can balloon into an explosion. And that's what happened in this meeting that I was attending that I dearly loved and um, and because of that experience I've learned that it's kind of paramount to recovery to come to a full understanding of what crosstalk is so crosstalk is um, when someone is, gets interrupted in their sharing let's say for example someone is sharing and they're really emotional 
And because, you know, I'm codependent, I'm going to pick up a box of tissue and hand it to them because I notice they're in distress. Well, that is a form of crosstalk because you just interrupted that person's flow of speaking by handing them a tissue. I know that seems harsh and rude. It's actually not. It's, it, it shows that person that is just speaking that, um, you know, my concern for you is making me uncomfortable. So I'm going to hand you a tissue, not intentionally, so that you stop for a moment. And again, that's probably not the intention, but that's what occurs. It interrupts their flow of talking. And being from dysfunctional family systems, that's kind of what happens. Um, we've come to know, in my experience for myself, is that, yes, I'm going to stop talking when you hand me a tissue because I've just shut down my feelings and I'm done. And so in order to provide safety for everyone, we, uh, we I guess at the beginning of the meeting, some meetings say, if you, if you need a tissue, please get it yourself or ask for one. So that way, if you interrupt your own flow, you can keep going. And so basically sharing is, is a very paramount part of recovery. And when we're speaking, that um, we want to be able to share what we're going to share, and we want to be able to do it in a fluid motion. And if it's and if some of what we're sharing is offensive to someone else, well, then that's their own boundary issue. And so crosstalk is a boundary um, securer. So it helps those people that are in the group to recognize where their own speaking boundary is, their own listening boundary, and their own ability to comprehend what is happening around them. So basically, crosstalk is a boundary violation in communication because, you know, sometimes people want to interrupt while we're in the middle of speaking, and that does happen in outside of these circles. You know, they'll say, you're saying something, and then the person that's that's either hearing or listening to you, or they may just be listening to give you advice at that moment. Oh, I would do this instead of that. Um, so there's that boundary issue. And part of recovery is to enforce our own boundaries. And I've learned that sometimes I don't do that because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what the other person is going to say to me if I do that. At the same time, I am the one responsible for letting the other people in the circle know, well, you know what, that's not part of my recovery, and this is a boundary issue for me, and I don't appreciate how I'm being spoken to or how that's being handled. So, you know, the opportunity to share is to overcome those fears. So, and sometimes, Sometimes you have these wonderful people that are in recovery that just love to talk, love to talk, talk, talk. I think they're awesome because that means I don't have to. <laughs> Again, that is also a boundary violation, as was just read, because um, that's domineering and controlling. You're taking over the conversation. You're taking over what's happening. And so if you share too long or if you take up too much time, depending on the group size as well, too, you know, there's that opportunity to expound too much or to, um, you know, sometimes if we speak too long, we, you know, we just start speaking random thoughts or random things that come in. However, you know, with, with what I've learned in recovery, if I'm succinct about what I'm going to share, then that's really providing a message versus, you know, whatever is happening in my everyday life which is important to me if that's what's important to me. At the same time, I do have a sponsor. I have a sponsor that I can share, you know, other things with. And so what I've learned in my recovery is that when I bring a message about something I've learned in recovery, then I'm sharing that. And then if someone has, um, so if someone shares right after I share and says, oh, Rita just shared about this, 
well, that's a that's a boundary violation, and that is referred to as crosstalk. Whereas if they so whereas if the person said, what was just shared impacted me in this way, and that way I'm not taking I'm not taking that person's words and um, putting my own spin on it. What I'm doing is I'm hearing what they're saying, and then I'm applying it to myself. And using my own language to share my thoughts or my feelings or express, you know, where where I came from, from what that was. So in speaking, uh, speaking too, speaking can also be a boundary crosstalk violation because um, sometimes when we speak, we may be... Um, are not really clear what we're going to say. And that's okay too. I mean, everything in a, in a CODA meeting is okay to share within these guidelines and, you know, structure in, in our CODA meetings is kind of what reinforces that safety. So when there's safety, then people are willing to come, people are willing to share and people are willing to listen. So as, as that occurs, then um, that helps the meeting structure. So when crosstalk is engaged in, in a meeting, um, so several examples would be, let's say that I shared about um, a circumstance where I was having difficulty with my spouse or my partner or in a relationship that was very important to me. And I was expressing, um, you know, sadness or sorrow or um, how how that impacted me. And it's a very emotional statement that's being par- parlayed. And and then as I'm sharing that, the person next to me might stop, might start physically crying, even though I may be not. I may be tearing up, and they are physically, emotionally touched by that, which is okay for them but it has just interrupted my flow because I'm codependent I'm going to turn to them and I'm going to ask them are you okay so then I have just lost what I was going to say because I'm too busy trying to care for your needs and so that that is a crosstalk um, violation as well so again crosstalk is very subtle it can take on many forms and it and it, it really de- detracts from my ability to grow in my recovery because I'm still taking care of the other person. And so, so crosstalk is a, in my perspective, is really quite significant to healthy meetings because when there's a healthy meeting and something does occur where maybe that's a repeated action by many people or specific people or even myself if catch myself then then I can you know address the group and say you know I just noticed that I I performed some crosstalk activities and I want to make amends so it's an ability to be able to recognize my own behavior because I didn't get that opportunity in the dysfunctional family system that I was in. You know, I, I just spoke when I was spoken, when I had to, or I yelled it because, you know, I had to get my words in, or maybe I didn't do anything at all. And so, so this, these phrasings in, in this crosstalk um, guideline, you know, giving unsolicited feedback, advice giving, you know, um, so when I, so if I've just shared something that was impactful and then another person shares something similar to what I've just said, that is crosstalk. So you've just taken my words, use them for yourself. And so from a crosstalk perspective, you've just diminished what I'm saying. And so so I'm pretty sure I'm not going to share again, and I may not come back to that meeting. And at the same time, I may come back to that meeting to 
see if it will happen again. So if it's a repetitive thing, you know, I may stop going. And so then I feel unsafe. And also, you know, when something is being shared, if, uh, if someone says, um, so-and-so from, I don't know, like a famous person, like, uh, who's like Ken and Mary, for example, they started a uh, recovery, you know, Ken and Mary stated this, and this is how they said this, um, that is crosstalk because I've just taken a known personality. I have put them into my sentence and phrasing and said, this is what they said. And this is how I'm going to do things. So that that's, that's kind of controlling and taking statements from someone else. So for crosstalk not to occur in that situation, I'd say, you know, in my recovery, I, I've met these wonderful people that have many years experience in this sort of thing where they've helped me to come to see that these behaviors, blah, blah, blah. So I'm, so I'm, so I know for myself who I'm talking about, but you know, it's that principles over personalities. Am I using these principles of this recovery program in what I'm sharing? And how am I doing that? Am I taking responsibility in the words that I'm using? Am I, am I owning that for myself? You know, I may, you know, there are many, many recovery books out there and they say many, many wonderful things. And I can share all of those things from my perspective using my own language. And so, you know, our traditions teach us that as well, is um, that, you know, every meaning is, is autonomous and they govern them own, their own selves. And so part of, part of the crosstalk is a group discussion in the group um, monthly uh, business meetings. You know, when there's a disruption of some sort, that's the opportunity for us to share. And crosstalk um, is a, for me, I, I believe it's a very vol volatile subject um, because, you know, people don't like to, uh, to, to be, well, I'm, I guess, singled out for doing something like that. However, you know, for CODA as a whole, it's, it's imperative that we come to a greater um, depth of what that means. And in recovery, it just means that I don't interrupt someone, no matter what it is, no matter how they're speaking about it. And I just allow that to, to come forth in whatever manner it, it does. If I disagree with it, cool, I'll keep that internally to myself. Um, so, so the free flow of talking, the free flow of providing information is, um, is you know, kind of significant to my being able to communicate. Communication in my recovery was not very good. And as I've gone to meetings and I hear people I take in that information. So early on in recovery, I didn't, I didn't really quite under understand what crosstalk was. I just, I had no clue or concept of, of what it really means. So what I've come to know for myself is that when, when I'm sharing something about my life, about my recovery, about why I'm here. I am doing that from, from a, a, a very afraid place. I think it's, you know, our, our guide to sharing says, you, you know, um, some of us don't talk because we haven't had that experience because it is scary. And for me, it was scary. And so when I was given the opportunity to share but then like immediately right after that, some someone maybe who has had significant experience in meetings will will comment and say, well, you know, when that happened to me, um, this is what I did. This is how I handled it. And this is 
what I'm going to do about it. And this is what the steps have taught me. Okay, I appreciate that. However, that was unsolicited feedback. I didn't ask you for that feedback. I didn't ask the room for that feedback. It was just given. And so, you know, again, very subtle sort of experience with crosstalk. And then, you know, some, and then there's body language. Body language in, in some recovery people is very significant because maybe that was part of our trauma, part of our history, part of our dysfunction is that if you're folding your arms and even though you may be cold, if you're folding your arms, I take that as you're not listening to me, you're not hearing me and I'm not being heard, you know, so you know, again, very subtle signals regarding um, crosstalk. So I've learned that I, I have to be consciously aware of what I am doing. I have to be consciously aware of where my actions take me um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, mentally. You know, I have to I have to monitor myself so that I am fully present during someone sharing. If I'm not fully present during someone sharing, that means something's going on with me and maybe I need to step away and come back. So that's part of, you know, crosstalk as well is when I'm not fully attentive that maybe I need to leave the room and come back. And sometimes I do do that. I need to leave the room so I can refocus and come back to a place where I'm, I'm, I'm feeling safe. So crosstalk guidelines are there to create an environment. I'm just going to use a very basic term, and it may not fit for everybody. It's a cocooning. I'm preparing this space for you so that you are comfortable and warm and that you feel the energy of that as in folding versus not being allowed or not having that, I don't know, boost under you that lets you know, yeah, this is okay. I mean, I'm just going to hold space for you. And so I've learned that um, crosstalk is is actually kind of like um you know it can become verbal abuse it it can be again based on what's happening in the moment what's being shared and how it's being conveyed or perceived i can never control how someone does that i can only control what i do with it and so when when i have a moment maybe in a meeting and someone is sharing something that's impacting me emotionally i'm going to allow that to happen internally but if i can't control it internally i'm going to get up i'm going to walk around outside of the the circle maybe i go into the hallway contain my composure and come back and then maybe after I've experienced that, I I can I can share, you know, I can say I, I really had some impactful moments um about something that was just just conveyed. Uh and I just wanted to share that because it was really hard for me. And and so, you know, there there are specific um Languages that we can use, um, you know, in sharing when something happens or when something occurs during a meeting. It, it's just that it comes with practice. All things in recovery come with practice. And part of my practice is to, I, I have a really good friend that tells me all this time, we can have all the knowledge in the world about of many things it's how we apply what we've learned to the situations that we're in so crosstalk is that same thing is i'm i'm going to hear the things that i'm going to hear 
and then I'm going to apply that to the circumstance that I'm in and I'm going to respond to it versus react to it. So when I'm doing that, I'm engaging everybody in the room. But when that engagement of everyone in the room creates a very intense or emotional sense that it, it that it stirs things in other people because there's we're, there's humanity in all of us there's some are going to react and some are going to respond so the reactors are going to be the the person personalities that may engage in crosstalk in that moment because sometimes feelings are overwhelming or even you know the emotions from someone else's feelings and that's when i want to oh this is what i want to do to fix it and this is how i'm going to fix it because i'm just going to say this and maybe and is that is that my own experience strength and hope that i'm sharing in that moment regarding this probably not in regards to crosstalk so how i would handle that is i'm having a really big emotional reaction about the things that have been shared and i just want to let you all know so i'm going to step out of the room and take care of myself so again there are specific ways we can handle these things and that provides you know an example an awareness to maybe other people in the room how to take care of ourselves how to express safety and keep that within a meeting and so you know i so that's my experience with cross talk i i find it for myself it makes me afraid to go to meetings sometimes at the same time i have to be willing to go to that meeting because maybe that's the meeting that fits in my schedule and then i have to be willing to address that maybe in the the monthly group conscience meeting you know and and share how i feel about that so crosstalk combines many components it combines speaking it combines sharing it combines listening listen versus hearing listening is uh in from my perspective is you know you're you're listening to the words that are coming out to, of the person that is talking but am i really hearing it am i really hearing what is being said so i heard this wonderful thing am i being a heart with ears so when i when i so when i look at that am i being a heart with ears so when i visualize that then i'm truly hearing what's being said and when i do that then that power greater than me can filter things in that allow me to speak without fear so crosstalk gives me the guidelines for crosstalk give me that boundary or barrier or you know my ability to build a boundary around that to know where i can gauge what i'm willing to do and it helps me to overcome my fear about speaking up about it about speaking up about those things that i um don't um well don't's not a good word those things that i think someone else is minimizing or someone else is um judging me on or you know all of those things so so i love cross talk guidelines because they help me know that i can experience my recovery in a manner which provides me safety and i've learned from all of my sponsors i am responsible for my safety i'm the one that has control over that so when i get in circumstances where i may feel that maybe this is not how that was conveyed i can say that you say i really appreciate how you're sharing that with me i I just don't really need that right now. So, you know, crosstalk is, I don't know, it's a really 
intense, deep subject. And I would encourage everybody to just kind of when you, when you know you have the opportunity to to look at look at the literature regarding crosstalk that you really read it to really just kind of ingest it because um, I know for me it has helped me it has helped me with boundaries um, boundaries um, around my communication boundaries around um, how I I speak to someone. And how I, I actually, am I hearing them or am I just listening? Um, am I speaking, am I speaking without contribution from my higher power or am I just speaking to be speaking? So all of those contribute to how crosstalk in a meeting can either be diminished or can grow. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's like a personal sort of experience that everyone has to have and everyone in their own manner in which that occurs to them that, and if you have questions about it, you know, you can ask someone in a meeting, is that crosstalk? Because I'm not really clear on that. Because there is no definitive, you know, range of what that is. We, we only have what I read earlier. Um, these are the things that it may be, you know, and you have derivatives off those things that can make it more pronounced or, you know, not. So again, it's a very subtle thing. And I, and I have to be very conscious of how I'm conveying something, how I'm sharing something and what, what it, you know, if someone's funny, I'm going to laugh. That's just kind of a given. Um, so, so it's not a strict sort of things. It's just kind of an awareness of my own behavior, an awareness on my own behavior based on the experiences that I've experienced. If I go to a meeting and I feel like I need to curl into a little ball and hide under my chair, then that is my body telling me that, I'm not safe. And then I have to figure out why am I not safe? So then if I'm figuring out that, you know, there's, there's, there are people sharing something intense and then the next person that talks is answering back or maybe two people are um, talking while there is sharing happening or Maybe there's a side conversation off to the, to, you know, just within earshot of the meeting that I'm attending. You know, those are all very distracting sort of things. Those are all criteria for talk. So it's just a better, um, I don't know, it's, it's a form of communication. So when I can understand, so when I can acknowledge those things with myself, then I can communicate those things outwardly to others where I can call attention to what is unsafe for me. So, so to wrap up is crosstalk is my opportunity to look at the behavior, the situation and to be accountable for my self by acknowledging am I experiencing those moments where I want to be quiet curl into a ball and hide under my chair or are there moments when I want to run out of the room what is occurring in the room that's creating this and I'm going to say maybe five times out of three there's crosstalk occurring but there's no actual way to um it just depends on my, I have to be aware of what that is. And I, and I hope that that makes sense. And I hope it was helpful to everybody that is listening today. And um, with that, I'll pass. Thank you, Rita. Now is the time for questions uh, and comments. So uh, if you'd like to unmute, 
by pressing star six. I see Jason has his hand up. Why don't you go ahead, Jason? You have to stop oh, good. Uh, hi. Um, <clears throat> so I've joined a step study and we're currently at step five. And a couple of weeks ago, somebody um, made a motion that we remove uh, head nodding as part of our crosstalk guidelines um, because they're more, more focused on trying to not nod their head as opposed to listening what people have to say. And I mean, I recognize that the guidelines are put there for a reason. And I mean, at first I didn't even really understand what the head nodding was about, but now I get that looking for that reassurance from somebody else nodding their head is a codependent behavior. Um, <clears throat> so we're actually going to vote on this again in a couple of weeks when the holidays are done. But I was wondering how you would approach that situation. Okay. So I sh want to go back to, to my own experience um, that, you know, we're human. We, we have, we, we, our bodies, um, you know, we've had years of where we've been trained to respond in certain ways and sometimes react in certain ways and so, um, and in, in, in maybe in one circumstance that that may be acceptable in another circumstance that may be offensive in another circumstance that may be acknowledgement of, of my actions at the moment. So, so it's a very, it's a varied perspective. And so when I can take it from that, from that perspective and recognize, is it harmful? How is it harmful? Maybe I need to ask the people, do you think it's harmful? Does it create, does it create an unsafe feeling or emotion or reaction or response when that occurs? Because I, I don't know that. I have to ask the questions. So, so it actually brings up the point of maybe there needs to be more communication about that. Does that help you? Yeah, because, yeah, we had <clears throat> two discussions on this already, and we kind of ran out of time, so we had to table it. Um, yeah, okay, so we can look at it and approach it differently and just maybe ask some more questions. Yes, and and I, I just want to add that, um, again, um, there, it's the interpretation of everybody in the room. How is that being interpreted? Because not everybody because we're all different human beings, we're going to see it differently. So, so that has to be kind of a, the consideration is, um, is it, is it, is it a loving kind of reminder or is it, is it, a, you know, because some, again, it could be perceived as a judgment versus a response. So there just, there just needs, needs to be sort of a, a consensus that's why there's a group conscience when the group the group conscience decides what everyone does so if the group conscience says that's what you're doing then that's what you're doing if that person that that's having a problem with that that's probably a reminder well we have had a group conscience and this is what we've decided thank you yeah. thank you you're welcome I can I guess, uh, Rita, I have kind of a question. <laughs> and what would you say about laughter during someone's share? Well, what do you say about laughter about during someone's share? I, I think I touched on that a little bit. You know, if it's funny and the whole group starts laughing, um, again, we're human. We're, we're, we're going to laugh when something, you know, tickles us. Um, and maybe the person that sharing that, that wasn't what the, that's not what they wanted or, or maybe that's not how they, they wanted that to be expressed. Um, so, you know, I think it's kind of like if someone burps in the middle of their share, that's funny, right? Or if someone sneezes in the middle of their share, someone in the audience is going to say, God bless you or bless you, you know, so those are normal human reactions. And those, 
because you're actually uncontrollable. So I, you know, if it, if it, if it hurts the person that's sharing, that's their opportunity to say, you know, I didn't appreciate everybody laughing. You could share that and then, you know, that could be the end of it. So I, I think it depends on the circumstance. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Sure does. Um, Thank you. So we have time for other questions and comments. Jason, uh, can I, did you have another comment or, or shall I lower your hand? Uh, you can lower my hand. Okay. I didn't know if I needed to do that or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to pause the recording for a minute. So, okay. Take it away. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, to maintain my, uh, my, my, my anonymity because of what I'm going to share, I'm not going to say where, where I'm calling from, but um, in, my, uh, in, my, in one of my share groups in my city, um, there is a person who, who, who regularly leads the groups. There's, there's never any business meetings with this group. I've been going for four and a half years. And this person continually uses we and you statements in, in his shares. And, and, and I call them his lectures. And I've actually left the share group once because I just found it intolerable. And I find I just freeze and I can't even share when I'm stuck in his group because our group is so big. We usually, we, our, our quota meetings attendance is really good at this meeting. Uh, it's so big that we split off into two or three groups and inevitably I get, I get stuck in his group and, and I honestly don't know what to do or say because, um, I just feel like I'm being lectured to. And everybody uh, being codependent, people, a lot of people nod at what he says. And he, it's just like he has this following, like they've made him his God. And I'm sorry, I'm sounding judgmental, but I find it very frustrating being a group who, who, who totally disregards the crosstalk rule. And, and this person actually leads the groups and doesn't have any business meetings. I don't know what to do. So I welcome feedback on that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I sort of had this experience in, in a meeting that I was attending and um, I, I did choose to leave that meeting because I, you know, in the beginning of my recovery, I didn't, I didn't know what to do either. I didn't know, I didn't know how to handle it. I just knew when I went to those meetings, I was so, I was afraid, but it was the only meeting I could go to at that time. And, um, so then I asked my sponsor and my sponsor um, provided me this really, there's this, uh, so in our fellowship service manual, um, there is a section in there about having a group, um, a group inventory. And so, you know, in this meeting, they had regular um, group, uh, group conscience every month. And because the crosstalk in that meeting was getting out of hand. Um, I suggested that I would like a group inventory done at our next. Um, I would like, like to have that during our meeting instead of at our business meeting because um, I thought it was important because, you know, that was the meeting I was going to and I, I needed that meeting. And so I, 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 you know, when they said, are there any announcements? Then I said, well, I would like to announce that I would really like to have a group inventory meeting during our regular meeting regarding the crosstalk that I am experiencing. And, and I would like to, to announce that here. And I would like um, a, a group conscience right now, you know, in this moment to to acknowledge if, if we could do that. And so half the room said yes and half the room said no. And so, so the next time we met, um, we had that group inventory. 
and when that happened, the people that said no didn't come back. And that was okay because it changed the dynamic of the meeting and it kind of repaired what was happening. At the same time, it also disrupted the meeting that 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 meeting actually never recovered. It's still struggling with its numbers. However, it is a healthier meeting because the people there now after the group inventory recognize how significant crosstalk is and how how it either creates or destroys the anonymity and safety that is part of our recovery. And so I would just encourage that maybe um, looking at that um, information um, about a group inventory and maybe, you know, asking, you know, some other people in that meeting that you attend, if they would be willing to support you in, in, in getting that done or, or having a group conscience about that. Was that helpful? Thank you. Yes, I really like that suggestion. Uh, the only problem is um, this person really runs the groups and um, he has so many followers. Like I said, they're all head nodders. And um, I just feel like I'd be outnumbered, but I really feel like this needs to be challenged because this group isn't being run like a, like a code of, well, I, if I can humbly say, I don't feel it's being run like like a code group should be run because of the safety factor. And I do know of people who have quit going to this group because of that, because of the amount of crosstalk that goes on. And I think nothing's going to change unless somebody steps up. But I, I'm, with my anxiety and my, you know, I, I find it, it's, it's so difficult for me to, to, to stand my ground. But uh, I do like this idea of suggesting and perhaps asking during the announcements about having a group inventory during a meeting because it's just never been done. There's never any business meetings. There's never any discussion. So um, anyhow, I'll put a lot of thought. I'll, I'll, I'll consider this. So thank you. And I'm open to any other suggestions. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Okay. So also, you know, there are, there are pamphlets um, that, you know, kind of help with this. There's, there's one about attending meetings. It, it talks about um, sharing, listening, um, speaking. Um, there's also the 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 booklet. Yes, I have on, that experiences with crosstalk, and I've underlined right. things. And I think, like, what do I do? Do I bring this to the meeting and and read from it and remind people? This is why we have these guidelines. You know, so, and we're not, and we're not supposed to inter. I'm sorry, and and then the fact that we're not supposed to interrupt when someone's sharing. I'm just biting my tongue because I want to hand him in the crosstalk guidelines and say, please don't use we and you statements. You know, do I just speak up and say I don't feel safe when I continue to hear these we and you statements and stories of other people? Like it just, I, I, I'm sure you can hear my frustration as I share this. Thank, thank you. Yes. Uh, say that. Say that. You know, the meetings are there for 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 me to express what I'm afraid of, what makes me safe. And if I'm not feeling safe, I have every right to mm -hmm. express that because I need the meeting that I go to to be safe. And I imagine, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes if one person speaks up, everybody else will jump on board. Even, you know, so sometimes fear prevents me from doing what I think is best for me. I, I you know, I'm, I'm codependent. That, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is my mode. I am going yeah. to do whatever it is I need to do so I don't have to create conflict or I don't have to create something, even though it may be unsafe for me. Yeah. In, my program, in my program, I have to be willing to step out on that uncomfortable zone and take care of myself. So if it requires me to, to say something that scares the bejesus out of me, then I'm going to do it because, you know, in our blue book, it says I will go to any links. Well, am I going to any links? So I have to mm -hmm. question that for myself. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Would anyone else like to um, ask a question or comment? Um, I'd like to report that the schedule for the CODA Fellowship in 2020 will be announced at a later date. And um, if no one has anything further to say, I guess I would like to add something before I uh, end the meeting with the cl cl CODA closing prayer. And that is that the, uh, the many CODA literature references that uh, Rita presented initially, um, I put them, I put probably not all of them. I put several in the chat for this meeting, you can copy them. But uh, it sometimes helps, I think, to announce that there's going to be a group study uh, about uh, the pamphlet experiences in crosstalk, for example. <laughs> That's not by saying, in order to fl uh, flout the uh, terrible behavior of Freddie, I'm uh, going to open this group, but, you know, just say, uh, I think that I would like to announce that, you know, Friday afternoons, we're going to go through the experiences in crosstalk pamphlet. And and from there, uh, other other things, you know, just marshal up, a, how do you say, uh, an agenda for CODA literature to be read by the group. That's one other possibility that comes to mind. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. So, and if, if there are no further comments, uh, let's close the meeting with the CODA closing prayer. We thank our higher power for all that we have received from this meeting. As we close, may we take with us the wisdom, love, acceptance, and hope of recovery. Um, let me end the recording. Thank you.